Okay, uh, I think recording has started. And uh, yeah, shall we just... By the way, I wanted to uh, run the session by sort of designating one or two or three people to sort of um, speak up a little bit more. I think when I don't do this, when it's just everybody in a room, there's kind of a bystander effect where nobody wants to speak up. So the person who organized this event, um, X Stacy, maybe I will designate oh, yeah. you as one of the participants. But yeah. if uh, anybody else wants to go ahead and volunteer now and, you know, volunteer as a person for me to pick on, please raise your hand or tell me now. Nobody? Okay, I guess I'll just pick on uh, X Stacy for now. Yeah, I feel like people will just talk as we go on. Yeah, sure. Anybody can raise their uh, questions as time goes on. Um, just, I prefer it when people actually start talking, you know? Uh, okay, so we are recording. And uh, the first question I'm getting is the ball going up and down. Is that the first question we're looking at? Yeah, golf ball. Train up and down. Yeah, so this probably shouldn't be too bad, right? So, I always like to draw a picture of the physical situation. But if we've got a person sort of throwing it up and down, they're standing on top of a building. Uh, ball one is going upwards. And then ball two is sort of going downwards, right? A golf ball is thrown straight up from the edge. A second golf ball is dropped at a time 1.19 seconds later. And we are asked what the initial speed of the first ball is if they hit the ground at the same time. Okay, so we do know the we do know the distance of the sorry we do know the height of the building I should say rather, and if this is B one and this is B two, the idea here is that we can just sort of write out the equations right. Um, I'm trying to think about how. I'm hoping to develop a better flow as we go along, but I'm hoping for a problem like this, I can just go ahead and sort of define the variables as we go, because I don't think this one is too involved. But I'm just using the kinematic equation to uh, express the distance, change in distance uh, with respect to velocity, time, and acceleration. But one half g t1 squared, right? This is basically saying the ball one will have a total net change of minus h, right? Because it's going up and then coming all the way back down. So at the very end, it's going to uh, decrease in height by h. So then v, uh, velocity initial of ball 1 is uh, something that we don't know yet. And uh, we also have t1, which is the time the ball 1 is traveling in the air. OK, so far so good. Good question. What's up? Um, how would you, like, out of the other four kinematic equations, why this one just, like, yeah. off the bat? No, it's, it's, that's a reasonable question. And maybe I should sort of run the session by hope, like, keeping all four kinematic equations um, up in a corner somewhere to just always refer to. But with something like this, you got, got to try, like, writing them out a little bit. Um, how do you put it? We're not too interested, like... We're not too interested in the other equations like vf squared minus v naught squared is equal to 2ax. Um, you know, some of this seems reasonable, but uh, the vf it just doesn't seem like we're just doesn't seem like we're terribly interested in it for what we're being asked to do. Now, chances are, because a lot of these are very interrelated, we probably could have done the problem with vf, but I'm going to write it out this way because, well, just sort of matching variables, it seems like. Uh, we either know everything about these two, except for the two unknowns, um, which is exactly what we're trying to find. But uh, for the other one, like velocity not of ball two is just zero, right? And uh, the time is going to be, let's call it t2 is the amount of time it's traveling. g t2 squared. And we do know that uh, t2 is equal to t1 minus... I think the number is different from everybody, but it's like, you know, 1.1 seconds or something, right? Not a big deal. But the point is, uh, T1 is an unknown, but T2 is sort of an unknown, but it's really just T1 in disguise. So this set of two equations has just these two unknowns. Uh, velocity not of B1 and T1. 
And as always, I will let you do the solving on your own. But at this point, we have a system of, I'll say it again, two equations and two unknowns, which is totally solvable. Do you all agree? Yeah. Yeah, very good. So then it's asking for what must be the initial speed of the fall if both are to hit the ground at the same time. Well, uh, yeah, that basically means it's just looking for this one, right? Yeah, choosing the right kinematic equation is, hmm, I guess at this stage it's kind of more of an art than a, uh, than a science, but more or less just look at what things you do know and look at your four kinematic equations and uh, try to see if you can get some good alignment going on between the variables you're looking for and uh, the variables you do know and what the equations themselves are. Right, so just to remind you, this equation I love to use, but it just seems like VF is kind of irrelevant to our problem, which is why I kind of shied against it. Okay. Oh, right, this is for B2. And now it says, consider the same situation, but now let the initial speed V0 of the first ball be given and treat the height H of the building as an unknown. Okay. Um, sure, why not? So <laughs> just in my silly little notation, I guess a straight line means that something is known, and a squiggle means that something is unknown. So I'll put a squiggle under H. So it's what is the height of the buildings must be for both balls to reach the ground at the same time for some given velocity. Well, okay, it changes the problem a tiny bit, but fundamentally it's still two equations and two unknowns. So just, uh, just solve, right? Once you have the system of equations set up and all the variables nice and in place, it, uh, it really shouldn't be too bad to just go uh, plug things in and solve them as if it was just a high school algebra course. Um, I'll write this just a tiny bit more explicitly, but T2 is just T1 minus 1.1 or whatever it is for your specific problem. Okay, that, I think that's the uh, first problem. Any uh, questions about it? So for your first equation, we'll have to uh, have it so that it'll be uh, B initial equals an equation which comes out to a number. I'm sorry, say that again? The first equation, what? Oh, for B1, for ball one, as in for problem one, um, it'll initially be um, VI, as in B initial equals an equation which comes out to a number. I... I'm not quite following what you're talking about, Rain. Is that what you're trying to, are you saying you're trying, that's what you're trying to solve for? Yeah, VI. Um, yeah, I guess you could do it that way. Um, how do I, how would I think about it? Uh, so, okay, for the very, for part A, basically, right, where height is known and velocity initial is unknown, um, how would I do this? I would probably start by solving the second equation. Uh, and solving T2, or rather T1, in terms of H. So then once you know T1, you would just plug it in here, and here, and then you would solve for V0. Does that approach make sense? Yeah. I think you were kind of proposing the other way with solving V0 first, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And uh, I guess that's doable? Yeah, I mean, you could solve for V0 in terms of T1, and then plug... Uh, V not in terms of T1. Well, the issue is, um, yeah, okay. You could solve for V not in terms of T1, and then I guess you could plug that into the second equation for T1, and that would let you solve, you know, then everything would be in terms of V not, and then I guess you could solve it that way. Um, I think it's a little bit confusing, but it should be doable. Um, but either way is fine. Fundamentally, two equations, two unknowns. Uh, nothing is more than a quadratic, so this should be perfectly solvable. Cool? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other feedback from anybody else before we move, before we, before we move on? Um, yeah, I have a question. What's um, up? So V0 minus B1 is just one number. Oh, oh, oh sorry. This, should, this is like an underbar. This is all like subscripts. This is like oh, okay, V0... Yeah like an underline B1, because uh, oh, okay. V0 underline B2 is also sort of a quantity in this problem. It just happens to be zero, uh, which is why I crossed it out over here. 
Oh, okay. Gotcha. Got it, got it. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, for things like my handwriting or notation or something, please speak up as soon as you have a question. Please do. Yeah. I think that's the benefit of having um, students ask things live is just to clarify stuff like that that I'm sure someone else is also going to wonder about. But cool. Okay. I guess we're moving yes, on. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. And well, I'll try to make these, uh, you know, go quicker and quicker as I get more into the flow of it. But uh, thanks for sticking with me for this sort of proof of concept. Okay, so the next one is sort of saying, ah, a UCI student running at a top speed of, uh, okay, let's just say that this is V naught is, you know, whatever, like five meters a second. I'm just making up values to not use specific numbers that, uh, you know, of any individual's instance of the problem. But you're trying to catch a bus, which is stopped. And when the student is still a distance of, I don't know, let's call it 40 meters, uh, it starts to pull away. So that's basically like saying this person is running at a constant velocity, v naught, and then the initial distance is 40 meters, and then it starts to accelerate with some acceleration, constant acceleration, uh, that we also know. I don't know, let's call it like 0.1 meters a second squared or something. Yeah. So this was actually a problem that someone already asked me about. Uh, I can't remember if I actually helped them or not yet. But just, first of all, I think visual, physical intuition is something that's very good to talk about. What's happening at first is that when the bus is still moving very slowly, because it's starting from rest and accelerating, the person is sort of going to make, uh, make up a great amount of ground, right? They're going to make up a great amount of ground because they're moving at constant velocity. They're already up to speed, whereas the bus is just sort of petering along, trying to build it up. And the sort of um, conceit behind this problem is uh, so long as the velocity not is fast big enough and the acceleration is relatively small enough, there should be a point at which the person uh, meets up with the bus, even as the bus has moved a little bit uh, to the right of its original position. Maybe the person, if they're fast enough, can still catch up. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that's crucial about this question is that 40 meters is not going to be the thing that you just directly plug into your kinematic equation. Because, uh, because uh, really what's happening is this person is going to end up at some distance, let's call it, um, you know, let's call this position uh, x final, is hopefully where they're going to both be at the end of some time period, t final, where they meet up. Okay. So that was a bit of a ramble. Um, but... When I was thinking about doing this problem, uh, yeah, so one of the things that we want to figure out is what the heck their, um, you know, what the heck x final is in terms of the student's variables. And that should be pretty simple, right? They're moving at a constant speed. So this is just v naught times t, v naught times tf. So just the student's final position should just be the, you know, total time uh, multiplied by their constant velocity. Uh, hopefully that's not controversial. So that's for the student. And then for the bus, it's going to look like um, xf minus 40, right? Because the bus is only going to travel from, uh, you know, the bus is only going to travel a smaller piece of uh, distance. And uh, if xf is the final position on the x-axis, you got to subtract out the 40 to account for just the amount the bus is traveling. So xf minus 40 is going to be equal to, let's call it velocity initial of the bus, or velocity not of the bus, times uh, tf. And uh, remember, I maybe I should have said this more explicitly, but let's say that time uh, is equal to zero the moment the bus starts accelerating. Yeah, so uh, t is equal to zero at the start. And the idea here is that, okay, velocity not of the bus at the start uh, was zero. So, okay. And then you have to add in one half a tf squared. So at this point, we have, I think we just have two equations and two unknowns, right? We know the velocity not, so I'm going to draw that as a regular underline. And then I'm going to draw a squiggle for tf and xf, because those are what we're trying to find. But you're going to see this theme again and again and again in this class. Oh, remember that we also know the acceleration. 
but we know we have two equations and two unknowns. So we can totally solve this. Do you all believe me? Yeah. Yeah. And I think from the challenge session um, earlier, I think a lot of people had uh, a little bit of discomfort with solving uh, systems of equations. But uh, I suggest maybe you go practice that a little bit. Um, I guarantee you that it is something you've seen before in high school. Just maybe the fact that it's wrapped up in a physics or a college level context makes it seem kind of scary again. But I hope it's something that you should be able to practice and get back up to speed if you just, uh, you know, do a little bit of elbow grease. But for what distance does the student have to run at 4.8 meters a second? Or sorry, of uh, whatever uh, speed before she, five meters a second before she overtakes the bus? Well, okay, that just sounds like it's looking for whatever the position, sorry, whatever the uh, uh, XF value is. And then from the XF value, you can also find the uh, TF value, right? And then if it's asking for how fast the bus is traveling, well, that shouldn't be so bad. So V of the bus is equal to, uh, remember the initial velocity is zero, so it's just all coming from the acceleration. And that should just be acceleration on the bus times TF. So that's part B, not too crazy, right? Once you have the, uh, you know, once you have the velocity, excuse me, once you have the time from the previous part, you know, you just plug it in, and multiply by a, and you're done. And the last part is asking us if the student's top speed is uh, cut in half or something like that. So C is if v naught is smaller. Uh, you know, it's like maybe half or a third or something. Can she still catch the bus? And uh, this is the part of the problem that gets really interesting. The previous parts are almost just kind of equation plug and chug, but this is the part where things start to get, um, require asking a little bit of physical intuition, right? So what's happening here is if the person is running slow enough, uh, even though the bus has no initial velocity, if the acceleration is relatively fast enough, well, it's gonna get away before the person reaches there, yeah? So what really matters here is the, well, the relative values of v naught compared to a. But how do we quantify this? This is a hard question, but uh, does anybody have any ideas looking at the system of equations? Does anybody know how to quantify this? It's basically saying, you know, if uh, v naught is much smaller, like the value decreases, um, beyond like which threshold will this system stop to have a valid, uh, valid system of solutions? That's kind of what it's asking. Does that make sense? Hoping to get some student input here, because I think it's kind of a, it's a mildly tough concept when you're seeing this in a sort of real world context for the first time. <laughs> X Stacy, do you see what I'm talking about? So initially, if you were to solve for the her top uh wait no if you were to solve for her uh for yeah. her vf or v final which was for the first part with sure. her top speed would you just like take a side by side as her top speed would be the minimum speed she'll need to catch up to the bus or are they just like yeah well uh just sorry i should uh, clarify i think the question asks uh not for the minimal uh speed that still works, but rather just they give you a small speed and asks, does this work? Yes or no. But uh, what oh, I, okay. you know, but that's not too important. What I want to get at is the idea of whether a system of equations has a solution or not. And I think this is a really deep and well, okay, it's not that deep, but I think this is a relatively important concept to kind of grasp. Um, in fact, I think that someone had a similar problem to this, maybe from a previous homework set. But the idea boils down to the quadratic equation, the fact that this is a uh, order two equation. Um, the idea is that if you replace xf with v naught tf and just sort of, you know, plug that. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I drew it. Oh, sorry, this isn't an equal sign. This is just the letter f. But the idea is if you plug in v naught tf for this, at this point, this becomes a quadratic equation in terms of tf, right? And the thing about quadratic equations is that 
Well, how many solutions can a quadratic equation have? Two. Two? Okay. What, what, what other numbers can it have? Number of solutions. I agree. Well, when, you, mm -hmm. when you put in a quadratic equation, you get a negative and a positive solution. Right. But, right. okay, so let me just uh, draw this out. Like, if you had a linear, um, if you have a linear uh, equation with a, a non-zero slope, you're guaranteed to have it intersect the x-axis. So you're guaranteed to have one solution as long as the slope is non-zero, right? So that's linear. So that's one solution. But with quadratic equations, okay, if it's dipping down like this and back up, that's great. That's two solutions, right? Wherever it crosses the intercept. But uh, with quadratic equations, what happens when you get something like this? How many solutions does this have? None. Exactly, zero solutions. So what this question is really asking is, um, when the relative values of v naught and a change, that's sort of essentially saying the uh, quadratic equation is sort of being like, you know, dipping up or down based on how those values change. Like if you can imagine going to Desmos and, uh, you know, using v, like turning v naught and a into sliders, uh, that will basically shift the uh, curve up or down. And oh, it's the, like knowing the transformations of the quadratic equation. Yeah, kind of, right? Like, uh, just sort of looking at the equation here, um, you know, the TF squared means that it's going to be a concave up, well, the fact that it's positive, right? Um, but if you have V naught TF uh, plugged in over here, this is essentially saying, um, you know, this is essentially changing, uh, shifting the equation around, shifting the curve around, rather. And the question here is, if the value of uh, V naught and A are you know, relatively small enough or relatively large enough to shift the equation, um, you know, up like this, then it no longer has a solution. And uh, the way to tell, uh, so, okay, now that's the visualization of what's going on. That's sort of the visual of the math behind the physics. But in terms of the actual just a quadratic equation, how do you tell from a quadratic equation how many solutions there are? Once you plug it into the quadratic equation? Uh, sure. But uh, just, yeah, I guess I'm sort of just doing a little brain teaser. Uh, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Can somebody remind me how to just take a look at the quadratic formula and uh, tell me what the criteria for 0, 1, or 2 solutions is? Do you all remember the name for this? If you can take the square root of the number. Right, exactly. Then, yeah. yeah, so we just want to, it's basically asking us to look at the discriminant. If uh, the discriminant is uh, positive, that's two solutions. If it's uh, zero, that means there's exactly one solution. And uh, if it's negative, well, unfortunately, uh, a negative discriminant means you can't take the square root, just like our friend suggested. And that means that there are no solutions. So just, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but essentially a negative value uh, in the discriminant corres correlates to graphs that are sort of uh, lifted up uh, and not touching the x-axis. It could also correspond to graphs just kind of in the other way too. But uh, yeah, I, you know, hopefully you've seen that before, but if not, you know, you learn something new. Um, but yeah, do you see why that basically answers that question? Uh, the question was essentially asking us, you know, if given a certain small top speed, will you catch the bus? Well, to do that, you just got to take a look at the quadratic equation in terms of TF and check the discriminant. And, and if it so turns out that it was the negative, it would have not been a exactly. Okay. And what that is saying, more or less, is uh, what that's saying, more or less, is that there does not exist any time at which the two of them have the same position. That's what that's saying. Sorry, was someone else uh, pitching in with a question too? Okay. Shall we move on? Sure. Okay, by the way, how do you think this session is going so far? Again, it's sort of a proof of concept. Um, but uh, do you think this is the right amount of talking about problem solving? Talking about physical yeah. intuition? 
you're not like giving the answer you're just like showing us you know so okay you're gonna need this and that mm-hmm. now now you try using your prior knowledge and yes et cetera. yes no it's definitely my hope that after uh doing the session or seeing the recording i'm hoping that you can get the problems done like twice as fast like if it uh i don't know how long does a set normally take you five hours yeah pretty yeah. much i'm hoping that it'll cut it down to like maybe two or so and i'm hoping that you'll also understand it better uh than you otherwise would have okay so the next one is talking about a rocket um is that right uh, about a rocket being yeah. jettisoned and discarding unnecessary parts okay very cool i noticed that there were two problems that were super similar but if we just draw a picture for this one it's sort of like saying okay the rocket's going up and it's got a canister uh it accelerates upwards at a steady uh given acceleration and when it's a certain height above the launch pad i don't know let's call it 200 meters above the launch pad it uh, ditches this thing so this thing initially has some upwards uh, velocity maybe let's call it v1 but uh, acceleration is just gravity and it's going downwards so it will eventually it will eventually pull it back to earth but once it's disconnected the only force acting is gravity okay great so how high is the rocket when the canister hits the launch pad assuming that the rocket does not change its acceleration okay so for a problem like this there are sort of three important points in time and i'm going to this is almost like a notational or an organizational thing but i'm going to try to show you how i would organize this problem um because sometimes when you have like T1, T2, T3, and you get them all mixed up, sometimes even if you understand the physics, that can make the math really, really messy and might spit out the wrong answer. So I'm going to try to make this a little bit more formulaic, right? So we've identified the three points in time that are or relevant. And the very first one is, I would say, uh, at the ground. So when the rocket is on the ground, let's call this T1, or maybe T0. And then at the time of detachment, let me call this T1. Uh, the reason, you know, the reason I chose one for V1 was because I wanted to call this T1 later. And then uh, T2 is when the little canister falls back to the ground. Okay, so T0, T1, and T2. And with this in mind, we, what the first part of the question is asking us to find is basically how high is the rocket when the canister hits the launch pad, assuming that the rocket does not change its acceleration. Uh, that's basically saying the rocket has been accelerating the entire time, uh, which is T2. So, uh, and it was at rest initially. So the height is just equal to one half a T2 squared. Yes? I've noticed that this equation is used the most out of any other equation. This equation is used more than any other? Yeah, sure. Right? This equation is basically saying when uh, velocity not is uh, zero, you can just totally ignore it, right? So that's all that's left is basically, uh, all that's left is the squared uh, term in time, which gets associated with acceleration. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, what else do we know in order to solve this, right? We have basically two unknowns, H and T2, uh, whereas, sorry, I decided that I would use squiggly lines, right? h and t2 and uh, this means that we need at least another equation relating these things at least another equation um so the other one is going to be for the canister it's going to say minus h is equal to minus velocity one okay really we have more than two unknowns Um, So this is going to get a tiny bit more complicated. But it's going to be the difference between T2 and T1. Minus 1 half G T2 minus T1 squared. And uh, unfortunately, we just got to do a tiny bit of extra legwork to figure out what V1 and T1 are. Um, I don't think that's too crazy, though, right? I don't think that's too crazy. Because they tell us that they do tell us that the acceleration was at whatever, I don't know, let's call it three meters a second squared. And, uh, you know, the detachment happens 
or essentially T1 happens when the the height is at 260. So we can essentially figure out what V1 and uh, T1 are, hopefully, by just uh, saying, what is it like? <laughs> Which equation should I use here? Isn't it V final squared? V if squared, does this work? Minus V not squared uh, is equal to 2AX. Yeah, very good. So, so uh, if this one is V1 squared and V not squared is zero, uh, what well, we know a and we know i guess you would call this the change in height which is h so using it very good you got this faster than i did um but yeah v1 will be able to tell us so this will be able to give us an explicit value for v1 and as for t1 uh we should just be able to relate it by saying what is it v1 is equal to a times t1 so now that we know v1 and a now we know t1 as well so plug that in as you need to. Okay, so after that little diversion happens, uh, all that's left are the two unknowns, H and T2. Very good, X Stacy. Uh, thank you for filling in when I had a lapse. But do you see that problem? The whole idea is, like you see this theme over and over again in kinematics, but when something is just a little bit too hard to solve with a single equation, well, then you just bring in an extra equation or two to try to solve for everything. Feeling okay with that? Yeah, I feel like the struggle, though, would be, like, starting with, like, figuring out which equation to start with to find, like, the unknowns. Yeah, okay. Maybe I like can try to talk about that a little bit more. Right, sometimes it is trial and error. But uh, for, you know, I guess just... I almost wish I could describe in words how I... Um, come across it. I feel like for most of these problems, I just instantly have intuition about which one to use. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Let me just quickly. Uh, maybe it would be helpful if I just pulled up on a screen the four kinematic equations, and so that at the start of every question, we can sort of go over which one to which one seems helpful. Hmm. Yeah, actually, it's going to be a little bit hard to do that with screen share, but maybe all of you can pull up the kinematic equations as you're following through, and uh, we can yeah, discuss at the start of every problem. Okay. Oh, sorry. Did this problem ask for something else? Was it also asking about like finding the peak or something? Oh, well, it asked for like the y, so the height, and then asked for the distance itself. Yeah. Okay. So it asked for the height, and it asked. Okay, I got you. I've asked for the total distance. So. The reason it's asking for the total distance is because going back to our picture, uh, even after it's released, it's still going upwards for a while, right? So it's going to keep going up for a little while until its velocity kind of peters out, at which point it comes back down. So uh, to do that, well, let's take a look at our kinematic equations. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so of the kinematic equations that we have, um, after solving this problem, we know what, excuse me, we know what V1 and uh, I guess T1 are at the moment of separation and uh wait so we're gonna have two uh, different times a time one and time two right or will they be the same thing so uh t0 t1 and t2 are sort of for the first part of the problem and uh the time at which it reaches the peak is not any of these times in fact i'm hoping to just avoid talking about time for this uh uh, for talking about when it reaches the peak. I'm hoping to just use a kinematic equation that doesn't even involve time, because I'm kind of lazy. Right? So of these equations, um, we do know the velocity at the moment it separates. We still know of the acceleration, or rather, sorry, the acceleration at this point is just going to be gravity, right? What is the condition for, like, do we, can you succinctly describe a condition for me, like an equation, uh, to describe what happens at the peak. Sorry, that was a very clunky way to word it. But I'm asking. Oh, oh like at the peak, at so like when it stops, there'll be no initial velocity from zero. Initial is the wrong word, but correct. Exactly. Oh. At the peak here, let's call this V at the peak uh, is equal to zero. So I think that strongly hints us to use the uh, equation that relates the two velocities together, right? This is sort of VF oh, yeah. and this is sort of V naught. 
And uh, that's great for us because VP squared is equal to V1 squared plus 2A delta X. Uh, excuse me, I guess this is maybe delta Y. Uh, just because we like thinking about Y being vertical. But we know this, we know this. This is just minus gravity, remember? And we know... Uh, sorry, we know this because this is just zero. So this is what we want to find. And this makes it very easy to do that. Yes? Yeah. So this is... Remember, this is the delta Y that... Uh, this is the delta y that describes its extra height after the initial 260. Oh. So oh, okay. you just have so to... I'll be the answer for number one plugged into two, pretty much. Uh, sorry, say that again? It'll be the answer we got for number one, or part A for this question, plugged into part B. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How high is the rocket when the canister hits the launch pad? Um, sorry, I guess uh, for part A, I should have reminded ourselves that uh, once we find T2, uh, we're basically going to want to plug it back into, uh, sorry, find uh, H. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, H is the height of the rocket once, uh, once, you know, T2 happens, once the canister hits the ground. Uh, that H is pretty much unrelated to the uh, maximum height achieved by the canister, which is going to be the delta y we found from. Oh, okay. This I part. Thought, did you change it to delta y? Yes. I thought like it was like talking about the first one, but you just changed it because y's respect like vertical. Yes. What, okay. I get it. Yeah. Sorry. I think one of uh, the comments that you made um, got me um, a little confused which part we were uh, talking about. But yeah, you would just take this delta y and then add that to whatever the height. It was at the separation, and that's going to tell you uh, how much total, you know, how much its total height is on the way up. So then you'd probably need to multiply that by two to get the total height up and down, right? Or total distance up and down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Shall we just keep going? Yeah. Bye. Okay. I hope this is uh, proving to be reasonably educational. But uh, right. So the next one is. We're talking about a bowling ball, and the person is sort of, I guess, kind of crouching downwards and just sort of heaving the ball up over some, you know, it's sort of accelerating it over this two meter stretch at some constant acceleration. From a height. Uh, okay. Excuse me. Sam, they heaves a bowling ball with certain weight. Okay, so remind, reminder that uh, weight is not quite the same thing as mass, so you'll have to convert, you know, you'll have to convert pounds to uh, kilograms, probably. Um, probably, I don't know. Look at the problem to be sure. But uh, giving it a constant upward acceleration from rest for a height of... Okay, gotcha. So I guess what they're saying is it's being accelerated over some delta y is equal to like, you know, 0.7 meters. But then the actual height itself is two meters at the point of release. So those are just two slightly different numbers, right? It's sort of like saying he's not picking it up from the, I guess it's saying he's not picking it up quite from the ground, but like some midway position, and then throwing it upwards. So just make sure to get that clear. But it's asking, what is the speed of the bowling ball when he releases it? Okay. So let's continue to get that practice with the kinematic equations, right? Um, of the ones that we do know, okay, so we are given the acceleration. We know the period over which it moves. And we also sort of know that the velocity initial is equal to zero because it's kind of implied that it's from rest. So with this in mind, one equation in particular should jump out for us to find the final velocity or the velocity on part release. Right? Which equation is that? Oh, I... I uh... Often, like just looking at the equation, I mean the question. It, there would be two unknowns, right? That would be the v final in time. Uh, yeah. What is it asking us? There's asking the speed of the bowling ball. How high does it go? How much time does he have to get out of the way? <laughs> um, just for um, sorry. Don't even worry too much about that many unknowns. Just to get the uh, velocity at the time of release, we should just need a single equation for that, right? Because we know v naught. We know the change in y. And we know the acceleration. It'll be Vf squared. Exactly. Right. 
So I'm going to call this, uh, I'm going to say T0 is, you know, at rest. I'm going to say T1 is at release. Uh, so this is going to say V1 squared is equal to V0 squared uh, plus 2A uh, change in Y. Okay, so that basically lets us find V1. Very good. And then it's asking, uh, how high above the ground does it go? Well, all right. So that's basically saying, all right, it's going to jump up to some maximum height. And then, uh, you know, and remember, let's just call this time T2, right? So T2 is at peak. T2. And uh, like before, you know that at the peak, the velocity is going to be zero. So V2 is equal to zero. Uh, so I think, again, one of the equations is going to be a lot more promising than the others. Um, if we want to know the total height differential from, from the point of release all the way up to the peak, I think this exact same kinematic equation is going to be most useful for us. Because that's basically saying V2 squared, which is just zero, is equal to V1 squared plus 2A change in, uh, I'll call this Y, uh, 2 comma 1 to indicate that it's the change in Y from time 2 to time 1. Yeah. Uh, did you swap uh, the V initial with the V final, or would the V final be zero at this in this problem? Uh, so what do you mean by swap, right? I'm sort of saying this equation describes a um, an interval of its trajectory. So from the, traje from the uh, interval where it gets released to the point where it reaches its very peak, the initial is going to be V1, which is at the point of release, and the final is going to be V2, the point of peak. Oh, okay. So it's sort of describing a different interval. It's not so much being swapped. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay, very good. Can I ask a quick question about the of course. equation? What's up? So first one, for delta y, would you use the um, height that they give you when he releases it? Exactly. Or the other height? Because they give you two. Um, yeah, so th that's a great question. And that's sort of what I was... Um, uh, that's what I was alluding to when we were talking about two different things earlier. Um, the, just by the wording of the question, it says that the constant acceleration is over, um, you know, is over a certain period, uh, you know, over a certain tr like track length almost. So yeah, you would take this one and plug it in over here. The, uh, the height of the two meters or whatever it gives you is just for calibration when it later asks how high above the ground does it go, period. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just uh, by reading the question, it tells us that this is the acceleration track length right, as opposed to this one. Great question. Thanks for clarifying. Thanks for asking. But uh, yeah, and if the last part is asking how much time does he have to get out of the way before it returns to the top of his head? Um, so I guess that's... I don't know if it's asking the time after release or the time from the peak, but uh, I'm sure you can find it really either way, right? So if the, this is basically saying, um, okay, so we know the, let's say time three is uh, at head height. Would that be the maximum height initially? Uh, no, T3 is going to be at head height, which is sort of saying when it goes, you know, all the way up and then comes all the way back down. That's going to be my okay. idea of T3. So the distance will be negative. Exactly. Distance will be negative. So you just take whatever the initial release height was, which was, uh, you know, two meters or something like that. And then, uh, you know, that's sort of the quote unquote initial height. And the final height is just whatever his head is like, I don't know, 1.8 or something. So then that's basically uh, delta Y is, you know, head minus uh, initial release height is equal to whatever V1 uh t3 minus t1 um plus one half uh, minus g t3 minus t1 squared right and, and this time around i sort of just gave away the kinematic equation but i hope it's relatively clear because you knew the initial velocity and uh you're being asked to find the t3 minus t1 right um 
Yeah. You're not being asked to find T3 and T1 independently, but you're asked to find the difference T3 minus T1. Oh, when you're referring to T3 and T1, as in we'll input T3 into where T3 belongs and T1 where T1 belongs in that kinematic equation, or? So for a problem like this, where we don't get too much information about um, when T1 actually happens, and when, like, how do you put it? We're not given too much information about when they happen absolutely. Uh, and the question only asks us about the relative difference between them anyways. So if you really just wanted to treat this in your head as just another variable delta t, and think about solving for delta t squared, or sorry, sorry, if you want to think about this just as delta t and solving for delta t instead of t3 minus t1, you can do that as well. Um, do you see what I'm saying? Like the problem doesn't care about the value of t3 itself or the value of t1 itself, it only cares about the difference between them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, keep going. Sure. Any questions on that one? Okay. The next one was the hardest uh, problem uh, that I saw on the set. Yeah, it looked long. Yeah. Since it was just one like question, like one question answer, I assume it's going to be a lot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's this very morbid question about uh, Iron Man stopping, uh, starting at the top of his building, and uh, and well, jumping off. I uh, I don't know. I guess his you know stock prices must have crashed or something. <laughs> but um, so what happens here is. They tell us the amount of time that happens between these two events where he's... Okay, so if the total height of the building is h, uh, they tell us a little bit about between these two events where the height is h over 3. So, like before, um, the way that I like to organize some of these problems is to just list sort of t naught as the starting position, time at the starting position, t1 as the first point of interest, and t2 as the time of the second point of interest. So. What this problem will require us to do is set up some system of equations. Oh, and by the way, we are told that t2 minus t1 is equal to like a second or something like that. That's given. But what makes this problem kind of hard is, huh? Well, I don't even know really how to describe it. Uh, it's just that there are quite a few unknowns this time around. And what I found was you have to use, um, a system of three equations this time around to solve. At least that's that's what I uh, seemed to run into when I was playing around with it. Okay. So we only have acceleration and time to be honest. Oh, pretty much. Well, sorry, what? Yeah, we do know acceleration is just uh, minus g. And uh, yeah, we get, I get this little period of time. But it's solvable because we can sort of, you know, the fact that we know uh, what period of time it takes to fall this last distance kind of gives us information about uh, how much time it takes to fall the total distance. And from there, because we know what gravity is, uh, we can reverse engineer the height. Does that like general flow kind of make sense? Right? Yeah, the fact that we're given up, the fact that we're given some information about, you know, an interval in this fall actually lets us. Um, actually lets us calculate the entire thing. And, uh, well, let's go ahead and take a crack and write down some kinematic equations. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the setup? Because I think this problem is a little bit harder than the others. They give you the one second, correct? Yes, they do. Uh, you know, it's going to be some value that varies depending on your own version. But, uh, Got it. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to write down some corresponding variables I think might be useful. Uh, v0 is 0, just because he's at rest initially. But let's let v1 and v2 be his uh, velocity at the corresponding moment in time. So what I did was none of the kinematic equations necessarily jumped out as being easier than the others. So I started just choosing, choosing one randomly, really. Uh, I just had to play around with it. But what I said to myself was, okay, if maybe v2 and v1 might help us, and that was really just sort of on a hunch, 
I said to myself, okay, let's take a look at the kinematic equation between, between him being at the bottom and being at the top. So that's 2AH. And let's also write the other kinematic equation for uh, being at the bottom being versus being sort of in the middle. That's equal to 2A uh, one third H. Uh, one little subtlety here is, okay, I guess I should just write it out. This is really minus G, and this is minus H, uh, but the minus signs kind of cancel out, so I don't really care too much. Yeah? And the same thing goes here, I'm just not going to write out the minus sign again. But the, at this point, we've, uh, we know that V0 is 0, so this sort of lets us relate uh, V2, V1, and H a little bit together. And this is two equations and three unknowns. So we kind of got to introduce, uh, so we kind of got to introduce another equation, unfortunately. But uh, what else do we know? We know that they uh, fell some amount of distance in, or in terms of h, in a certain amount of time. So let's try using the equation for, uh, the equation for travel, which is just, uh, minus one third h is equal to minus v one, and that's going to be t two minus t one uh, minus one half g t two minus t one squared. And just as a reminder, just as a reminder, we uh, totally know what t two minus t one is. We don't care about the individual values; uh, we just care about their difference, which is a second or something like that. So that is to say, we know what these values are. Uh, we know what g is, that's just a constant. But at this point, h and v1 are going to be our unknowns. And at this point, we have a system of three equations and three unknowns. And this is technically solvable. And that's actually exactly what I think I would suggest for you to do on your own. Um, but does this scare you at all? A system of three equations and three unknowns? Have you ever done anything like that in high school? Probably. Probably? Most likely, but yeah. like, I wouldn't believe to this extent. Yeah. No, a system of three equations and three unknowns um, should be solvable, essentially for the same reason a system of two equations and two unknowns is. Um, that's a result that you'll talk about, talk, a uh, talk about a little bit more if you get to linear algebra. Um, although for this particular equation, uh, you notice that uh, some of the stuff is not necessarily linear, because uh, there are some squares here. But, uh, you know, whereas I would le totally leave you on your own if you were solving two equations and two unknowns, maybe I'll look just a tiny bit at the calculation to sort of give you a, maybe a guiding hint. But remember that at the end of the day, we want to figure out what H is, right? We want to figure out what H is. So, I don't know, how do we want to do this? Um, I would think about maybe, like, the point is, we want to eliminate this in some way. I'm just trying to figure out a pattern that might be a little bit easier than the others. But like, if you take these two equations and subtract one from the other, uh, that should be able to get rid of v2 squared, right? And that would just leave you with v1, and some expression of v1 squared, and some expression of h. Okay. So then if you have some... Ex so, yeah, if we call this equations a, b, and c, the first thing I would do is take equations b minus a. And then at that point, that's going to look something with v1 squared is equal to something with h. And with that being the case, I would take this equation b minus a and plug that into, uh, you know, isolate for v1 or isolate for h and plug that into equation c and solve. And the rest I think you should be able to take on from there. Does that make sense? So part A, B would be like setting the equation equal to each other, getting an answer, then plugging it into the last equation. Uh, yeah, you could think about it that way if you want, right? You could think about like isolating V2 squared in both of these equations, right? So then you would just basically move V1 squared to the other side, and then you would set this, so like you would put V1 squared over here, and then you would just set this part equal to this part. And uh, that would probably serve you well. 
then when once you, you do that, what's up? sorry um when you do that would you solve for h uh you could do really um like once you start to unravel it you can solve for all of them but for this one i just uh how do you put it you could isolate v1 squared and then square root it to plug it in over here and solve for h um but that being said that might leave you with two choices you might have to, you know, because v1 is going to be equal to the positive or negative square root of v1 squared, right? You might have to try both values and see which one makes more sense. Um, the hint sort of tells you that... Uh, by the way, someone's um, mic is echoing right now. Can you turn that off? Sorry. Uh, the hint tells you that this gives a quadratic equation for height h, and you'll need to use the <laughs> binomial equation choose the, to solve for h, choose the larger of two solutions. Um, yeah, basically, the fact that there's two different choices for V1, uh, a positive and a negative, means that, uh, well, it means that there's going to be two different values for H as well, and I guess the hint is telling you to choose the larger one. My guess is that one of the values is going to turn out to be negative, which is kind of nonsensical, but, uh, as I haven't calculated it myself, I can't say for sure. Okay. So that problem was probably the hardest one we've seen so far. Any questions on it? The uh, bright side is that if you can solve this problem, you should probably be able to handle anything in kinematics. Really? <laughs> uh, anything in a, at least a freshman kinematics course. Uh, I don't know about the physics uh, competition problems. Those can be absurdly difficult. Yeah, those are just like a pain. Uh, no, I was not the best student in high school. I got a little bit more serious towards the end. Um, you know, I didn't get senioritis in my last semester of high school. It was the only semester I actually uh, put effort in, really, because I wanted to develop a work ethic for college. Um, but after having, you know, slacked off for all of high school, I go in my last semester and I take the, uh, uh, was it the Physics Olympiad? And I got my butt absolutely kicked. It was 25 problems, and I don't even know if I answered, like, more than five of them right. Um, yeah, if you can answer 10 correctly, you qualify for nationals or something like that. But those are some really hard problems. Um, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, any questions here, or shall we move on? I feel like for that one, I'll just spend time on it. Yeah, no, I maybe, yeah, spend time on it, play around with it, get some feel for what's happening. Um, you know, you can look, take a look at the recording to sort of... Uh, to sort of hopefully guide you as well. But one of the perhaps slightly unmotivated things I did was just say, okay, let's take a look at these, uh, this particular kinematic equation. And the reason why I did that was because it's sort of either going to be this one or it's going to be the one like delta x is equal to v naught t plus one half a t squared, right? Uh, those are sort of our. You know, of the four kinematic equations, it's basically this one and this one are the more complicated two. So between these two, I was really hoping to avoid talking about time as much as possible, which because uh, the time between uh, jumping off the building and the time between landing. I don't know. I just had some hunch that I really didn't want to deal with it. The reason I used it for this part, though, was because T2 minus T1 was given. But. Uh, Maybe it was possible to do this problem by using this equation instead. It's totally possible. Um, but I just find this equation a lot neater, uh, in my opinion. Okay, any other questions, or shall we move on? We can move on. Okie dokie. Okay, this problem's kind of neat. It's talking about uh, Kobe, or a basketball player, jumping up really high and uh, talking about the amount of time that they hang in the air. Uh, this is really cool. I never realized this. But let me give you the sort of motivation for the problem in the first place. They're essentially saying that if this is a uh, height versus a time graph, the, the spirit of the problem is basically asking you to show that if this is y max, and this is sort of the halfway point, y max over 2. 
uh, they're essentially asking you to show that the um, the amount of uh, the size of this interval uh, where they're above the halfway height is actually really, really large compared to the time where they're under it. And I guess the spirit of this problem comes from just the fact that parabolas are kind of have some concavity to them, right? If this was a, a linear equation instead, like that, uh, then you wouldn't notice this effect. But because it's a parabola, you know, you sort of have this like bowing shape to it, this uh, bowl shape to it that makes this uh, interval so much wider. I actually didn't know this. I guess I don't know enough about basketball to have ever really thought about the, um, you know, the physics of it. Um, but do do do. Yeah. So let's identify some key points here, right? Uh, so if this is T naught, the point at which they leave the ground, this is T one, the point at which they hit Y max over two, and uh, this is T two, the point at which they reach the max. And because of symmetry, we don't really need to care about these points coming down, right? We can just, uh, you know, the hint tells us to basically compare this interval to this interval. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, just to make it a little, the wording a little bit more consistent with the problem, let's let t0 be equal to zero as well. So sort of stopping the, uh, sort of st starting your stock clock starting your stopwatch at zero. Okay. So when I was approaching this problem, I just said to myself, okay, we know some, like Y max is, we're not given the explicit value, but we're kind of like, it's almost as if the problem is treating it like a given, uh, so to speak. Um, and I don't really know how to explain that other than saying that you know, the problem is sort of treating y max over 2 as a special value and y max as a special value, even though they don't explicitly tell you what y max is. Um, you know, we have some hunch that solving for things in terms of y max um, should hopefully help us a little bit. I don't know, maybe at the end of the day it cancels out, uh, which is what I suspect is going to end up happening. But basically, I'm going to pretend that it's a pseudo known value for now. And I'm going to say that vf squared minus v naught squared, uh, excuse me, it's like v2 squared minus v naught squared is equal to minus 2g times y max. And uh, v2, of course, as we've always done, when you're at the top, your velocity is just zero. So this essentially lets us relate v naught to y max. Okay, well, let's do something similar for the halfway point. So v1 squared minus v0 squared is equal to minus 2g y over 2. Minus 2g y over 2. And uh, v0, v1 squared is equal to... Excuse me, I think I made an actual maybe error in my calculations here. Yeah, something very silly. Um. The other thing that we know is that as the hint actually tells us, we can relate V naught to GT because that's essentially saying, uh, you know, the kinematic equation where we say that a uh, change in V is equal to acceleration times time. Well, if we do that for the entire interval where he starts at the bottom and ends up at the top, that's essentially saying uh, v2 minus v0, the initial velocity, is equal to minus g times uh, t2 minus t1, or t0, and this is just 0. And uh, v2 is also 0. So this is essentially saying v0 is equal to g times t2. Okay. So far, I think uh, so far so good. Um, and that basically lets us get an expression for, I think that lets us plug it in for over there. Yeah, I'm sort of uh, having to wing it right now because I realize I actually dropped a uh, thing in my calculations. But the other thing that they uh, tell us to hint is to do this exact same equation, delta V, 
is equal to um so this is the change whereas this one was for the entire duration of the uh, upwards leap this one is just going to be for uh until it gets to the halfway point but that's just going to look like uh a times uh t1 so between two and one and this this is between two and zero so that's essentially saying v1 is equal to v naught minus g times uh, t1. Yeah, very complicated. Um, this is one of those things where I'm just writing down so many equations, uh, and eventually we just got to figure out how to solve this stuff. Uh, we do have a relation between v naught and y max, and a relationship between v naught and uh, t2. So by transitivity, that lets us relate y max and t2. Sorry, uh, I realize that this uh, explanation is probably the one I've fumbled the most so far, um, but I'm hoping that at the end of it, we'll get some level of clarity. I feel like this is, uh, this is another question, uh, another like problem. If you get this, you could get everything else. To be yeah, honest. like I know that, uh, you know, on my notes, I, uh, I made one error that I can correct for. Um, and I know that I could get this problem. It's just a matter of, it's just going to look very physically unmotivated. It's just going to look like a big page of equations that I just sort of mash together and get a solution out of. And I realize explaining that to a student probably isn't the nicest thing. So I'm trying to create some sort of narrative here. And uh, that's not always very easy to do. But, okay, so we know that this is a special equation. This is an important equation. This is important. And this is important. Um... And what else do we know? We also know that y max is equal to v naught t, uh, v naught t two, right? So again, t naught is zero, but this is basically saying the kinematic equation for traveling in height. You know, the, by the time you get to the maximum height in t two, uh, it's minus one half g times t two squared. Yeah, this is this is not the neatest. But at the end of the day, we want to find an expression for uh, t2 minus t1 over t1, which sort of means that we want to solve for uh, t1 and t2 to get some expressions in terms of the other constants in the problem. And we, we don't want to put anything in terms of v0 or v1 because we're not explicitly told what those are. But Here's what I'm seeing right now. Remember before I said uh, we could put v naught and y max in terms of each other? And this lets us put t2 in terms of y max. So this lets us put something like t2 is equal to, you know, something something y max. Okay, that's progress. That's really good so far. Um, now we want to say something about t1. Right? If we can say something about t1, then we're probably done, to be honest with you. Uh, the only time I see t1 in these equations, really, is unfortunately over here. So t1 is related to v1 and v0. Well, okay. Like before, we said that we knew how to uh, put v0 in terms of y max, so we can plug that in over there. But what is v1? Ah, yes, here's what v1 is. V1 we can put in terms of V0 squared, right, which can come down from above. Um, and in terms of Y max. So we can put V1 squared also in terms of Y max and plug that in. So this lets us isolate T1 in terms of a bunch of Y max terms. And then once we have T2 and T1, we plug them into this equation and we're done. How are you all feeling right now? I, I, I think that was probably the worst explanation I've given so far this night. But I want you to know that this problem is possible. <laughs> this seems like a check problem. This seems like a check problem? A check problem. A check problem? Well, fundamentally, everything I've written here, like every individual equation seems reasonable, right? Sometimes in physics, if you don't know exactly what to do, 
um, just writing down every single valid equation that you have in the situation, um, you know, is uh, sort of the default move after you've checked the more obvious options. But the point is, working backwards and sort of reverse engineering the motivation, we're trying to figure out expressions for T2 and T1. And those come from the V0 is equal to GT2 and V1 is equal to V0 minus GT1 equations. Right? So at this point, we're basically just trying to figure out ways to express V0 and V1 in terms of Y max. And that's what these two equations are for. Yeah. Are these uh, being recorded? They are. They are. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that makes it, uh, takes a little bit of the pressure off. Um, I don't think this equation ends up being super useful now that I'm thinking about it. Um, perhaps you can get away with just using these two and plugging them in over here and, uh, and here. I'm sure there is a way to do it with this equation, but uh, I guess that's not how I thought about it. Sorry, folks. Am I, uh, am I scaring you? No, I'm just questioning how long this is going to take. Questioning how long this is going to take? Yeah, this question, when I just re go back to the recording. Slowly. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, like, do you see that there is a solution? Like, there is an outline of a solution on page here? So it won't be a uh, numeric answer, or will it? Or be, like, an equation at the end? Yeah, that's a really good question. So they don't give us any explicit numbers, right? But I bet you what's going to happen at the end of this expression is going to be a bunch of stuff times y max and a bunch of stuff times y max for t2 as well. And my bet is that all the y maxes are going to cancel out and end up with a genuine fraction. I bet you're just going to end up with a real, like a real fraction number between zero and one. And I think that'll be great. Yeah, I'm probably going to compute this myself because I think it's pretty neat. And I'm very curious what the final, uh, what the final answer is. I uh, never really thought about basketball this way. Yeah. Uh, Let's have you all, you know, work through this problem over the week. And if it turns out to be, you know, uh, really difficult still, maybe I'll try to redo an explanation for it, okay? I, uh, yeah, I might be able to find a simpler way to explain it or motivate it. But okay, we're getting to the end of the problems that I took a look at. But uh, the next problem is sort of saying, what angle does the tangent to the curve y over x is equal to, I don't know, like sine squared of like x or, you know, over something like, you know, there's some coefficient in front of x, but I don't really care plus 17 sine of cx at x is equal to some certain value. And uh, the way to do this problem, right, it's going to look like some weirdo, it's not going to look like a perfect sine curve, it's going to look like something uh, kind of wacky, because there's a sine squared and a sine. Yeah? But the idea behind this problem How do I put it? So the idea behind this problem is calculus is going to save us. Yeah? Because what calculus lets us do is figure out what y prime of x is. I'm going to just redraw this to sort of zoom in on a certain point. Uh, y prime of x is going to let us say, all right, this is basically a tangent line, right? Are you all kind of familiar with the idea of a tangent line at this point? Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, this problem is sort of wrapped in some kind of scary trig terms, but really it's just asking you to take derivative and figure out what the tangent line is. Because uh, y prime is basically going to be the slope of the tangent line, right? And once you have the slope of the tangent line, uh, that is basically going to be your vector information. Uh, my my pen just appears to have died here. Interesting. But uh, this problem should be quite simple, even though it might seem kind of scary at first. Uh, does that make sense? Once you once you get the information for the derivative, uh, that should tell you what the you know what the slope is, and from the slope you should be able to figure out what a appropriate value for theta is, if I remember this correctly. Yeah. 
because you can kind of think of a slope in a 2D graph as basically a vector. Does that make sense? If you just think of a tangent line as a vector, then suddenly you should be able to figure out what the angle is um, by just, I think, taking the arctan or something like that. Yeah? Okay, okay. Yeah, so like, let me just give you a super stupid toy example, right? Like, if the slope was like, uh, you know, minus a half, right? That's basically saying the rise over run is like one over two. And you should be able to figure out the angle from there. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, this is not the hypotenuse, by the way. This is like rise over run. Rise over run. But yeah, that's, that shouldn't be crazy, right? That shouldn't be crazy. Okay. Uh, yeah. What's up? Oh, no, no, go on. Yeah, yeah moving on. So... We're looking at minimum stopping distance for something traveling at, oh, I don't know, it's just whatever meters, you know, the speed is whatever meters per second. I don't know, let's call it 20. And uh, let's say the, you know, stopping distance is uh, 40 meters. These values probably line up, including the distance traveled during the driver's reaction time. So, Reaction time is, I don't know, half a second or something. I don't know if these values are self-consistent. I just made them up right on the spot. Uh, but I'm probably sure that whatever values you get from your uh, homework assignment will probably be self-consistent. But it's asking, what is the minimum stopping distance for the same car traveling at a, at a different speed? Okay. Minimum stopping distance. Uh, I'm trying to remember how to do these problems. Is it basically saying that the brakes just apply a certain acceleration? I think this is maximum and minimum external. I think so. Because the mm -hmm. teacher was um, relating back to it. Really? Hmm. I'm actually not too sure. I, I haven't seen any problems like these for a while. Uh, maybe ever. But even though it uses the word minimum, I'm really not thinking calculus for this problem. Um, minimum stopping distance. Like, I think what the minimum stopping distance just tells us is basically the maximum deceleration the brakes can apply. I think that's what that's saying. Hmm. But then again, I don't even know if the... Yeah, maybe I'd have to think about this one. I'm really not sure how to treat these problems at the moment. I, uh, including the distance traveled. Okay, so the driver's reaction time is just some, like, you know, constant spacing because, uh, you know, because they just can't react fast enough, right? So whatever reaction time times whatever their uh, speed is that they're asking you is going to give you some distance where they're, you know, moving before the stopping is being applied. So this is full speed, and this is the braking. And I guess the acceleration for the braking is just pointing them in the opposite direction. I just, uh, I'm not quite sure if we can assume that it's a constant, acce uh, constant acceleration or not. I, I don't really know how to do the problem if it's not constant. Hmm. Do you happen to know any more context off the top of your head as to what the teacher said uh, regarding uh, use of calculus? Approach, um... Can this be approached just using kinematics or not? Well, that's the sort of what I don't know here, is whether or not it's a reasonable assumption for acceleration to be considered pos uh, constant or not. Um, yeah, how else would we think about this problem? Like, let me put it this way. If acceleration was just constant, uh both throughout the duration of the braking and in the and you know there's sort of two different scenarios at two different speeds right and if acceleration is constant over both of them then this problem is really not so bad then this problem really isn't so bad because then you would just you know for the second problem at a higher speed 
you would calculate the uh, distance it travels during the reaction time period. That's pretty simple, right? That's just D is equal to RT. And then over here, you would calculate the distance uh, just using, uh, how would you put it? Uh, excuse me. You would basically use one of the kinematic equations is equal to 2A delta X. So the problem tells you what delta X is indirectly. You just have to subtract out whatever um, the reaction time distance is, right? And then you can s basically solve for A is, assuming that it's constant, because you know v velocity final is zero, and you know what velocity initial is, right? So then once you have that, you would just plug it back into the exact same equation. And except for it's just a different V-naught value. Yeah, and then you're just solving for delta x instead. You see that? So that's how you would do the problem if this assumption held. Uh, if not, I don't know. I don't know. Does that make sense? So this, if if it said acceleration was constant, or if it had acceleration in the problem. Yeah, um, I mean, if acceleration was constant across both, uh, both, sorry, across both scenarios, then I would be pretty confident that something like this is a solution. It's just I'm not sure if this is a reasonable assumption or not. Um, but you know, if this isn't the way to do it, then I'm really not sure off the top of my head what the uh, what the correct approach would be. Maybe we just ought to revisit this after a little while. Let's see if we can find an example from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting pretty close to the end here, right? Uh, it's taking a little bit longer than expected, but I think it's still pretty good progress, anyways. Um. Next problem is saying a rocket is being launched upwards. Uh, with a tiny piece falling off at a certain time. So again, let's call t naught and uh, v naught to be the time where it's taking off. And uh, let's let t1 be the point where t1 and maybe v1 are the point where it falls off. And let's maybe let t2 and v2 be the point where it touches the ground. Uh, this problem is almost identical to the other problem we saw earlier with the well, it was basically the same thing with a rocket lifting off and a canister falling, right? But yeah. I think the variables that they give you are just a tiny bit different because they don't tell you what the acceleration is. They just tell you a rocket is launched straight up with constant acceleration. You're told that four seconds. So if T naught is equal to zero, T one is equal to four. A bolt falls off the side of the rocket, and then T two is equal to. Um, or instead of using, you know, exact numbers, they'll just tell, I don't know, like maybe five. And T2 is like, you know, it tells you another couple of seconds later, let's say six seconds later, is equal to like 11 or something, right? So this problem, you basically know all the times, and it's asking you to find the acceleration or the other quantities. And, uh, you know, that's not that so crazy. You only have time. Yeah, you only have time. Interesting. So that makes me think <laughs> that... Okay. Um, Okay, that does change things a little bit. Uh, maybe it would make the maybe it would make the delta y equation a little bit more relevant because v not t uh, v not t one is zero uh, minus one half g t one squared. So this relates delta y, which is you know the maybe let's call it y one, the height at which it achieves when it falls off. And keep in mind that it's still going to be going upwards for a little while, right? But okay, that's one equation and two unknowns. Maybe we can solve this, uh, set this up a little bit more. Um, I guess minus y1 is going to be v1 times t2 minus t1 minus 1 half g t2 minus t1 squared. Okay. Uh, so this introduced an yet another unknown, right? So at this point, y1, v1, and t1 are all unknown. But we should be able to get a relationship between some of these. Because the velocity at that point in time is going to be related to the... Uh, 
uh, stuff by acceleration. Yeah, so that's just going to be... Oh gosh, this is kind of hard. Y1 is equal to 1 half A T1 squared. And V not, V1 is equal to uh, A T1. Okay. I think that's it. I think that's it. Because once you plug in for Y1 and for V1, at this point, your only unknowns are acceleration. Oh, I'm sorry. We do know what T1 is, right? We do know what T1 is. Um, I so will, like, acceleration be, like, a time? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, acceleration will it's be... weird. Sorry, what? Oh, it's kind of odd. Kind of odd? <laughs> uh, sorry, what do you, what do you mean? So we only have one known, which is time, and I guess we use one of the equations to like um, algebraically manipulate the uh, the equation so we could get acceleration only using time. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying, right? We plug this in over here, and yeah, weirdly enough, it kind of feels like we're done, which makes me think that I must have done something wrong. Because a rocket is launched straight up with constant acceleration, right? So that sounds like initial velocity is zero. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. These are the exact same equation. That's why. This and this are the exact same equation. I'm just having a brain fart. So you, you can't plug the exact same equation back into itself. That tells you nothing. So let's ignore this. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but it looks like this is actually a legitimate thing. We could maybe plug in V1 over here. And at this point, yeah, I don't know why I wrote one half g squared. This should be one half. This should be a one half a t squared. My bad. You see what I mean? I, I accidentally assumed that it was accelerating under gravity, which makes no sense. It's accelerating under the jet fuel with some constant acceleration. But once we plug this in. Uh, now it becomes a system of two equations with unknowns A and Y1. And at that point, it becomes perfectly reasonable to solve. So problem wasn't that bad. I just made a total brain fart and uh, wrote things out in a... Sorry, I wrote gravity instead of the actual acceleration, which is why we got confused. Does that make sense? Um, can you rephrase it a little bit? Sure, yeah. So really, I'm just going to erase this a little bit, right? Um, there's just really two equations relevant here, or maybe three. But y1 is the height it achieves, um, the height the rocket achieves after sub t1, right? After however many seconds it takes to get up, uh, however many seconds it takes for the canister to fall, that's just one half at squared. Yeah, it's one of your uh, basic kinematic equations. It was the one that you said was the most common one earlier. And then on the way down, the canister is basically going to fall a height of minus y1. It has some initial velocity from the rocket's acceleration. But uh, other than that, it's just going to fall towards the ground according to this equation. So the only thing to do here is replace v1 is equal to a times t1. And once we have that, let me just maybe rewrite it, a times t1. And once we have that, the only unknowns are a and y1. And we can solve. See that? So initially, we need to find y1 first and get Uh, You can do that a. if you want. Uh, two equations, two unknowns, you can solve them in either order. Uh, but the bottom line is that it's asking for acceleration. You see what I mean? Like if you had a plus b yeah. is equal to 10 and 3a plus 2b is equal to 5, uh, you can solve for either one first, right? It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you'll get answers for both. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Gotcha.
Sorry, that one was on me. I uh, overcomplicated a little bit because I wrote the one equation out a little bit incorrectly, and it uh, led us down a straight path. But, uh, you know, when it comes to physics, you can always sanity check yourself. Uh, the fact that it was... Um, the fact that earlier we had y1 is equal to minus one-half g t squared uh, didn't make any sense at all, because that means that the rocket would have been going into the ground, which would be catastrophic, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So let's look here. A sprinter can accelerate with constant acceleration for 2.3 seconds before reaching top speed. He can reach the 100 meter dash in, or, you know, sorry, whatever the values are. Uh, I don't know, like two seconds and maybe a 100 meter dash in 10 seconds. But this to me is basically screaming, um, Use of two equations, right? Vf squared minus... I'm just going to write them both out and see which one seems more appropriate. 2a delta x. And uh, delta x is equal to uh, v naught t plus one half a t squared. So v naught is zero. v naught is zero. And uh, we do know the time. We do know the distance. And we do know the acceleration. We're just trying to find the final speed, right? Wait, we know the acceleration? Or is it, yeah, when, is it, it, when, when it means it's only constant, it's only 9. Oh, 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 you know, you're right. We don't know the acceleration, do we? we? I'm sorry, we don't. We know how long it is. Sorry, I read that problem wrong. My bad. But yeah, we know delta x. We know... Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I read this problem wrong. It's saying that he accelerates for some period of time before reaching top speed at which point he, it's presumed that he runs at a constant speed. So to draw this, it's sort of like saying, you know, he's accelerating over this period, uh, and then acceleration is equal to zero afterwards. Yes. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. My bad. Thank you for, uh, thank you for correcting me. Um, but, okay. So what's going to be important? Okay, let's just try to draw this out again. Uh, yeah. We got to the end of the problems that I quickly glanced over, so I'm sort of working these from uh, working these on the fly. But if t naught is equal to zero again, and then t two is essentially equal to you know ten seconds or whatever it is, I think Usain Bolt actually runs a little bit faster. But we'll uh, we'll ignore that. Uh, it's basically saying that this distance right here, this distance covered right here, is going to be. Uh, t2 minus t1 times whatever velocity uh, at 1 is. Yeah? And this distance right here is just whatever is left over. What's up? Oh, can you say it again? Yeah. yeah. So if he uh, accelerates to speed t1 at this point, and then everything that's left is just... Uh, you know, this distance right here is basically his velocity, the top speed, times the uh, time of the interval, which is just t2 minus t1. Yeah? So then this distance is just yeah. 100 minus t2 minus t1 times v1. We also know that v1 is equal to t1 times a. That's just describing the period over which he's accelerating. And, uh... Yeah, what else do we need to know here? What is this? It, they're basically asking us to find V1 at the end of the day. It's T1, A. Okay. Um, I'm going to write down some equations. So V1 squared is equal to V naught uh, squared, uh, which is just zero, plus 2A uh, delta X where delta x is equal to this value over here, the 100 minus this thing. This is tough. Or maybe I'm just being dumb. Because uh, we don't know what v1 is. We don't know what a is. And we also don't know what t1 is. And, like... When they just say part A and that's it, I usually like think it's going to be a long one. Yeah. It's going to be like a lot of equations. 
But this problem doesn't have that many details, so perhaps we're just doing something a little bit, uh, maybe I'm just being a little bit blind right here. Um, wow, I'm amazed that uh, the problem can be described so succinctly. 100 meter dash. So what else do, what else am I not making use of? We do know the total time and we do know the total distance. I feel like I'm not using that information to its fullest potential right now. But let me try writing down another kinematic equation. You know, sometimes I just feel like I need to blindly um, fumble around a bit until the picture becomes clear. But it's V naught times T1. So, so let me say that uh, delta X, let me call delta X to be the first, uh, the distance traveled in the acceleration phase, okay? But uh, delta X is equal to V naught times T1 plus one half A T1 squared. And again, this is zero. So I'm trying to figure out how many equations I have and... Quick question. What's up? When they mention constant acceleration, do we have to find the constant acceleration or is that just, it's just void at the end? Um, I'm betting that we'll probably find out what the constant acceleration is over the course of the problem. Yeah, that's my bet. Uh, but right now, what's bothering me is that we essentially have three unknowns, V1, T1, and A. And what's, super, what's kind of making me a little bit uncomfortable is that I'm not really sure how much information we have. So 100, well, T2 we know, T1 we don't, and V1. Okay. You know what? I think we're done. So if delta x is equal to this thing, uh, the two unknowns, again, are T1 and V1. If we plug that in over here... Oh, shoot, but then... Uh, okay, so A is equal to V1 over T1. It looks to me like if we just uh, plug in delta X and plug in A, it looks to me like these two equations are going to be entirely in terms of V1 and T1. So two equations, two unknowns can be solved. Yeah. It, uh, it seems a little bit funny, and I hope I'm not getting a tautology here. But I think we are incorporating all the information we're given in one form or another. Excuse me, in one form or another. Uh, let me just work this out a tiny bit more, okay? So I'm going to write out this equation right here, V1 squared, is equal to 2 times, what is the acceleration, V1 over T1? V1 over T1, and then there's delta X, which is 100, minus T, well, T2 minus T1 times V1. And then 100 minus T2 minus T1, V1 is equal to 1 half, V1 over T1, T1 squared. It looks to me like this is not too bad. Because down here, 1 half A T1 squared. V1s cancel out. This lets us solve for T1, essentially. This lets us solve for T1. And then we can plug T1 that in. What's up? Uh, T1 refers back just to the time, right? Wait. I'm sorry? Does it? Well, T1 just refers back to the time. T1 is the time or... that he uh, gets up to full acceleration. And uh, the rest is a constant. Uh, the rest is a constant speed. I'm noticing that I made a tiny little mistake here. We can't just cancel out V1. Uh, because I, I wrote this messy. It, this is 100 minus this thing times V1. But the point remains, at this point we have two equations and two unknowns. And two unknowns. Right? So there's a T1 and there's a V1 in both these, and they can be solved. It should be able to be done. Um, yeah. It's just going to be a little bit messy to plug into a calculator. Oh, sorry. Um, it might be a little bit messy. You might have to plug it into a calculator, but hypothetically, this should be done, right? 
I hope so. You hope so? Yeah. No, it's uh, V1 squared. Yeah, no, it looks... Uh, I think this looks good to me. Oh, no, I didn't make a... This doesn't the same equation, is it? V1 times T1. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm looking at this a sec a little bit more closely, and I'm worried that this might just be the same equation in slightly different forms. But this looks like V1 is equal to 2 over T1. Hmm, yeah, these are the exact same equations. That's not good. It's, in fact, just a single equation. <sighs> Damn. So that's actually, this actually is not enough to solve. These are the exact same thing. So we need to find some other thing relating the two of them. And, uh... How do I do that? I feel dumb. I, I feel like I must be making a really, really simple error somewhere. Or overlooking a perfectly good equation for some reason. But... What am I not using here? We're told that they accelerate for some period of time. Time. I'm so stupid. They told us what the value of T1 is. We didn't have to solve for it at all. They told us what T1 is. Uh, the 2.30 or the 10 seconds? The, the 2.30, I think. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. I've been making this so complicated. Uh, it's really, at this point, it's just one equation and one unknown. Uh, this is known. Uh, you know, all these values are known. Known. The only value you need to solve for is V1. Yeah, I'm sorry for making that more complicated. Maybe I'm just too tired today. Do you see that? This is actually not that complicated of a question. I think I just read it really wrong. I, uh, had completely forgotten that one of the values was given. Do you see what I mean? So, I'll just, like, be able to just plug it into a kinematic equation. It should give me the answer. Yeah. No, this one was, uh, this one was probably my bad. I, uh, forgot that T1 was already known. And, uh, plugging it into your kinematic equation of choice, like this one over here, will essentially let you solve. Yeah. Oh. Alrighty. When an Alfa Romero sports car accelerates at a maximum possible rate, its motion during the first 20 seconds is extremely well modeled by a simple equation. Okay. So it's saying that Vx squared is equal to 2p over m times t. Where, okay, so power is just equal to some constant. Mass is just some value and Vx is meters per second. All right, so it's asking about the car's speed at time, at a some certain time. Wait a minute, that's not that hard at all, right? The car's speed is, you know, if you know the velocity or the square of the velocity, you should be able to figure out the speed just fine. Yeah? It's motion. Wait, say again? Yeah, so if, if they're asking us for the speed, but they already gave us the velocity squared, like, the speed should be really, really easy to find, right? Because speed is just equal to the uh, absolute value of... Excuse me, the absolute value of velocity. Right? So initially, it'll be the square root of 2p over mt. Yeah, I think so. Um, this seems deceptively sim simple or complicated. But if they literally um, tell us the I'm, expression... What's up? I noticed you had to convert into meters using the uh, 1,200 uh, kilograms. and But with the scientific notation from the um, P, which is the, the car's watts, how uh -huh. would you convert that? Watts? 
Uh, I think Watts is already in SI units, so I don't think you really need to worry about conversion in this problem at all. Right? Mass is in kilograms, VX is in meters a second, uh, power is in watts. I think you can just literally oh. go in and plug everything in. Put it into an, an equation. Oh, yeah, okay. So you can just plug this in, into a calculator. Yeah, me. wait a minute. This seems like the simplest problem on the set. Wait, let me just attempt this real quick. Yeah, that seems a little silly. Um, find a symbolic expression. Ah, yes. And part C for trying to find a uh, you know, acceleration just requires you to take a derivative. So acceleration is equal to a derivative of v of x. Do -do -do. First 20 seconds. Huh. Mm -hmm. Wait, uh, for what part did you say was the derivative? Oh, the uh, last one. When they talk about acceleration, uh, when they're asking for acceleration, right, that's just a derivative of velocity. Yeah. Uh, just what's a little bit funny is you don't really know anything about the signs for this problem because they give you Vx squared. Uh, you don't know whether velocity is positive or negative, which is odd. But I mean, I, just from the word problem, it sounds like everything is going in one direction, accelerating in one direction, so maybe it's not a big deal. Uh, maybe just assume everything is positive. But uh, yeah, I'll leave the uh, derivative part to the individual student, because I think that's pretty straightforward. Fair enough. Right? And uh, yeah, I think we're getting to the very end here. Uh, yeah, if we consider the, the one. yeah, if we consider the following function of variable r, uh, okay, it looks like some polynomials multiplied some by some exponentials, and it's asking you to find the value of the first derivative at a certain point. Okay, that's just taking the derivative and plugging it in. Uh, you know, I won't do the calculation there, but uh, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, you know, assuming that you've got a baseline comfort with calculus. But then, okay, it's just asking you to take a second derivative and plug it in again. Sure. And then find the value of r, where y takes its minimum value uh, on the positive r domain, or rather the non-negative r domain. Uh, do you know how to do optimization? Um, I have, I have a note card on it. Sure. I haven't. Have you taken yeah. calculus? Yeah, I have. Gotcha. Uh... Yeah, optimization should just be uh, taking a derivative, right? And then, do you remember what to do after that? I haven't got one of those like problems in a while, but I should sure. know just by looking at it. Yeah, it's an example. Uh, yeah, it's you know I'll just give you the reminder, but to try to find critical points, uh, you look at when y prime of r is equal to zero. And uh, the general idea being that for a maximum or a minima, when the derivative is equal to zero, uh, you know, there's a chance that it kind of looks like a maximum like this. Yeah? Or correspondingly, a minimum. But you've got to go through and check that it's actually a maximum or minimum. 
and uh, also check the boundary points. So yeah, that's basically what we got. Oh, fair. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, it's also you also got to check to make sure that you know if the function ends up looking something like this, right? Then it then it turns out that the or sorry, yeah. If the function ends up looking something like this, then it turns out that the minimum is going to be right at the boundary point. So you just got to, you know, maybe graph the function and just do a sanity check. But uh, yeah, that's the gist. That was. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was the fun. physics set in about two hours. It's uh, you know, definitely some rough rough patches here and there, but you know, I think as a proof of concept goes, it you know still went uh, well. It's basically getting everything finished in about two hours. You just have to figure out how to do the rest on your own. And I thank you for everything. Yeah, these two hours were they went by pretty fast. Actually. Oh, that's good. I'm just curious. How long do you think it would have taken you to do this uh, on your own? Because this looks like a pretty extensive homework set, right? Like at least one or two of the problems here were pretty involved. Um, realistically, I guess without using Google, probably six to eight hours. Six to eight hours. Gotcha. Yeah, just off trial and error, trial and error. Mm 